Mr. Prime Minister, my friend Bibi, uh, thank you very much for one of your generous welcomes here again. Uh, I'm very appreciative, very happy to be back here in Israel, <clears throat> and uh, uh, only sorry that uh, it's a short time and a short visit. I uh, thank you for your generous uh, hospitality, and I pick up on your comments uh, uh, that uh, the road ahead is not easy. Uh, if it were easy, peace would have been achieved a long time ago. But what is clearer than ever today is that this is a road worth traveling. And so I'm delighted to have spent uh, <clears throat> a good period of time, <clears throat> excuse me folks, <clears throat> the benefits of a lot of travel. <laughs> um, I'm really happy to have spent uh, a serious amount of time with the Prime Minister uh, this afternoon uh, talking in some depth about the challenges of the particular road that we are on. Uh, this is a follow-up to a very productive meeting that I had in London last week with President Abbas. So I am talking to both presidents directly as we agreed. Don't. Elevate me to the realm of president. Uh, president, yeah. prime minister, and president. I apologize. I'm, I don't want to I do can't, that. I can't. I can't reach those heights. Uh, <laughs> both and leaders. I, and I respect Mr. Paris greatly. You know. I am talking to both leaders uh, directly, and everybody, I think, understands the goal that we are working for. Uh, it is two states living side by side in peace and in security. Two states, because there are two proud peoples, both of whom. Uh, deserve to fulfill their legitimate national aspirations in a homeland of their own. And two states, because today as we commemorate the 40th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War, I think everybody is reminded uh, significantly of the costs of conflict and the price, certainly, that Israelis have paid in the quest for their security and identity. Uh, the Prime Minister and I and all of the parties involved have agreed that we will not discuss details at any point in time. We are convinced that the best way to try to work through the difficult choices that have to be made is to do so privately uh, with confidence that everybody will respect that process. And since I have asked for that from all the parties, I'm not going to break it now or at any other time. We will not discuss the substance of what we are working on. I do want to comment, however, as the Prime Minister has, on the uh, challenge of the region and what we have just been doing in the last few days of negotiations in Geneva. Uh, and that is, as the Prime Minister has said, an issue that directly affects the stability of this entire region. And ultimately, weapons of mass destruction, which are at stake in this issue, uh, are a challenge to everybody on this planet. So this is a global issue. And that is the focus that we have tried to give it in the talks in Geneva in the last days. But we want to make sure people understand exactly what we are trying to achieve and how. The ongoing conflict in Syria has enormous implications for all of the neighbors. The press of refugees, the fact of weapons of mass destruction having been used against the people of their own state. These are crimes against humanity, and they cannot be tolerated, and they are a threat to the capacity of the global community to be able to live by standards of rules of law and the highest standards of human behavior. So I want people to understand the key elements of what we agreed to in Geneva. It is a framework, not a final agreement. It is a framework that must be put into effect by the United Nations now. But it is a framework that with the Russian and U.S. agreement, it has the full ability to be able to, as the Prime Minister said, strip all of the chemical weapons from Syria. The Russians have agreed. They state that the Assad regime has agreed to make its declaration within one week 
of the location and the amount of those weapons. And then we will put in place what we, what we hope to put in place through the United Nations, what Russia and the United States agreed on, which is the most far-reaching chemical weapons removal effort well beyond the CWC that has been designed. Now, this will only be as effective as its implementation will be. And President Obama has made it clear that to accomplish that, the threat of force remains. The threat of force is real, and the Assad regime and all those taking part need to understand that President Obama and the United States are committed to achieve this goal. We cannot have hollow words in the conduct of international affairs because that affects all other issues, whether Iran or North Korea or any other. The core principles with respect to the removal of these weapons and the containment of these weapons, which we want to achieve, as we said in the document, in the soonest, fastest, most effective way possible. If we achieve that, uh, we will have set a marker for the standard of behavior with respect to Iran and with respect to North Korea and any other state, rogue state, group that decide to try to reach for these kinds of weapons. The core principles will have the full backing of the international community through the UN Security Council. And Russia agreed that any breach of compliance, according to standards already set out in the CWC, any breach of the specifics of this agreement, or any use of chemical weapons by anyone in Syria will result in immediate referral and action by the Security Council for measures under Chapter 7, which means what they select up to and including the possibility of the use of force. So again, uh, I reiterate, diplomacy has always been the preferred path of the President of the United States, and I think is any uh, peace-loving nation's preferred choice. But make no mistake, we've taken no options off the table. President Obama has been absolutely clear about the remainder of the potential of use of force if there is noncompliance or a refusal to take part because the egregious use of chemical weapons by the Assad regime against innocent men, women, children, their own citizens, all indiscriminately murdered in the dead of night is unacceptable and we have said in no uncertain terms that this should never happen again. This country understands the words never again perhaps better than any other. I've been in contact with many of my counterparts, with Foreign Secretary Haig of the United Kingdom, Foreign Minister Laura Fabius. Uh, the, their partnership on these issues has been essential, and I will see both of them tomorrow and Foreign Minister Davutoglu of Turkey in Paris, uh, where I'll also meet uh, Foreign uh, Minister Saud Faisal of Saudi Arabia in order to talk about the road ahead to achieve our goals. Our attention and our efforts will now shift to the organization of the, prevent of the prohibition of chemical weapons and the UN Security Council, and the international community expects the Assad regime to live up to its commitments, and we expect Russia to join with us in holding them accountable. Uh, I also want to make clear, this effort is not just about securing chemical weapons in Syria. We are not just standing up for a red line that the world drew some 100 years ago uh, and which is worth standing up for. Our focus now must remain on ending the violence, ending the indiscriminate killing, ending the creation of more and more refugees that is not only tearing Syria apart uh, but threatens the region itself. As President Obama has said and I have said many times, there is no military solution to this conflict. We don't want to create more and more uh, extremist elements, and we don't want to see the implosion of the state of Syria. 
So our overall objective is to find a political solution through diplomacy. And that needs to happen at the negotiating table, and we will stay engaged with a sense of urgency. And I say to the Syrian opposition and all those in Syria who recognize that just removing the chemical weapons doesn't do the job, we understand that. And that is not all we are going to seek to do. But it is one step forward, and it, re it, it, it eliminates that weapon from the arsenal of a man who has proven willing to do anything to his own people to hold on to power. Foreign Minister Lavrov and I met with Special Envoy Brahimi yesterday. We will meet again in New York. We are committed to continue to work towards the Geneva II, and we have made clear that our support to, to the opposition in an effort to get there uh, will continue unabated. So, Mr. Prime Minister, I know you and I are both clear-eyed about the challenges ahead. Uh, we have to summon the grit and the determination to stay at this, to make the tough decisions. Tough decisions about eliminating weapons of mass destruction and tough decisions about making peace between Israel uh, and the Palestinians. We will not lose sight of the end game. I know that from talking with the Prime Minister today. And I think both of us uh, remain deeply committed, and we hope very much with our partners uh, in the region uh, to doing our best to try to make this journey towards peace uh, get to its destination. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. Good job. One hell of a sound bite. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you.